Coming up, should we start the engines of war or take the path to peace? I'm deeply concerned about Saddam's efforts to acquire nuclear weapons. But is there time? Just two hours ago, Allied Air Forces began an attack on military targets in Iraq and Kuwait. As I report to you, air attacks are underway against military targets in Iraq. We are determined to knock out Saddam Hussein's nuclear bomb potential. We will also destroy his chemical weapons facilities. I'm hopeful that this fighting will not go on for long and that casualties will be held to an absolute minimum. This is an historic moment. We have in this past year made great progress in ending the long era of conflict and Cold War. We have before us the opportunity to forge for ourselves and for future generations a new world order, a world where the rule of law, not the law of the jungle, governs the conduct of nations. The biggest thing I saw was one of the most fantastic fireworks demonstrations I've seen since uh, our, uh, Fourth of July party uh, years and years and years ago. This was tremendous. Baghdad was lit up like a Christmas tree. In Santa Cruz, California, reaction to the war was immediate. As television reports began to announce that U.S. and Allied troops had begun bombing Baghdad and Kuwait, students of the University of California in Santa Cruz came together to march through the streets to the downtown area. It doesn't seem any surprise to me that we were about to cut military spending for the first time in how long. And suddenly, there's a need for all this military equipment. So I see it as a tragic loss for our educational programs, for our social services, for the space program, for anything that might be good. I think people don't have a clue yet about the ramifications of the, this war in terms of the cost to the American taxpayer. And I think a lot of people are genuinely asking the question, you know, if we, if we can't afford a war on poverty, we can't afford a war on cancer, a war on AIDS, a war on hunger, a war on homelessness, how in the world can we afford a war like this? And uh, I think initially there was a very strong, uh, almost an adrenaline rush of anti-war sentiment, and that was expressed the first several days in these massive street demonstrations. I don't think people involved in social change movements in Santa Cruz, I don't think people had ever seen that many people, in a sense, on the streets. And um, there's been some kind of sporadic street actions that have been condemned in the press and so on as being violent, but I think those were largely the product of the sense of rage that people felt at the beginning. And some people even took strong exception to the occupation of freeways and stuff here as a uh, sign of violence. But I, I think that uh, it's a reality that people have very strong feelings against uh, starting a war, especially if they start a war that's not necessary to start. And you have 17 votes. That war is an action that can never be condoned and that we were hoping that if we would try to shut down this university and if other universities would hear that, that they would join in with us, that we would be able to maybe link up with labor unions and be able to shut down the country, basically, as a protest against this war. And we think it's very necessary to shut down universities for a short period of time so that students can educate themselves and re reclaim the education that is their right. Three o'clock. 
But I see these men in Washington acting out of terrible fear and desperation. That is, they may have these terrible armaments, this terrible firepower, but these men are very frightened. Because this is a very desperate kind of action to take. It comes out of colonialism. It comes out of colossal arrogance in the idea that this disintegrating colonial power, or if you prefer imperialist power, yeah. thinks it has the right to continue to rule the world when in fact it is in a state of collapse. Media coverage of this rally and other pro-peace events was limited and distorted. During one of the blockades of Highway 17, a local news crew showed up to do a live report. However, the scene did not fit the image that they'd wished to broadcast. She knows you guys are blocking traffic because you are protesting American involvement in the Persian Gulf War. Now, if we can't get that simple message out because there are so many people screaming in the background and flipping off the camera and things like that, that's just not going to work because we can't have that kind of profanity going out to a million and a half people in this area because they will call up and complain and the FCC will yank our license. Right. Print media also suffered from self-censorship. The war in the Gulf is hyped as our rights at home are sinking. The January 28th issue of Newsweek magazine revealed answers to a poll which posed the question, should the government continue to allow protests or should they be banned? 23% said the protests should be banned. The censorship is at its most blatant. I've seen it in a long time. I've worked as a journalist off and on for 10 years and um, studied the Vietnam War. I think that we're going to have a lot of amazing reports come out after the uh, war comes out of things that we're not finding out now. And the stuff I've heard now is horrendous. I also find it sad that it's not just about censorship. It's also uh, propaganda that for every report I hear about what's going on, I hear 10 interviews with somebody's mom who's hopes their son is killing the bad guys, you know. And the propaganda mill is just going really full steam ahead. What has not been censored is this country's renewed interest in red, white, and blue. I have a long history of not flying the American flag. And that isn't because I'm not proud of my country in the sense of being, I am an American and I'm going to work to improve it. But I'm not even included in the Constitution except for my right to vote. So I, you can call me patriotic when you put me in the Constitution. I think people fly the flag at the moment to show that they agree with what the country's doing. When the American flag is flown by itself, I'm, I'm pretty sure that most people would agree, and that almost everybody in the anti-war movement would agree, that it's a symbol of patriotism and of support for the president. Why are these people supporting the murder and slaughter of people in the Middle East? Uh, as far as the Yellow Ribbon is concerned, initially there was a struggle for, by both sides, by the anti-war movement and the pro-war movement, to use this symbol to, to support their views. America, America, we come to you. America, country of hope. In San Francisco, some police vehicles exhibit U.S. flags, while in Santa Cruz, Many of the police cars have yellow ribbons. In a telephone interview, the deputy chief of police of Santa Cruz commented on the yellow ribbons. And I don't think it's uh, whether you're, you're, you're you know, for war or against war or you know, something along those lines, because I don't think anybody's for war. I think it's just an uh, uh, indication of support for the, uh, the people that have to, uh, you know, have to go. We try to 
stay apolitical as best we can. Uh, you know, we at the police department are not uh, we're not advocates one way or the other. Our, our job is, uh, is enforcement of the law, and not to to take sides on uh, most issues. The display of U.S. flags and yellow ribbons indicates a rise in feelings of patriotism and nationalism, which has been accompanied by a rise in prejudice against Arab Americans. The FBI has started to question Arab Americans um, in regards to potential terrorist activities. They've been mostly focusing on Iraqis, as I understand. Um, but the disagreement I have with that policy in general is that it questions Arab American loyalty. It puts that um, in an unsure position. The simple fact that somebody might protest uh, a war does not mean that they are uh, belligerent or acting against the government. It's a basic fundamental American right. And Tens of thousands of people did exercise this fundamental right when between 75 and 100,000 people marched through San Francisco on January 19th. Two days later, on January 21st, there was a women's march in San Francisco. Another march and rally took place on January 26th. In the 1980s, Japan became the world's number one economic power. In 1989, the nations of Eastern Europe attempted to restructure. While in the United States, civil rights have collapsed at the hands of fundamentalists and national insecurities at an all-time high. X on and on and on and on, the ministers of doublespeak, new definition of clean, they try to teach us. The danger of only shampoo off the valve, these greases, completely jerry curled the beaches. Pipe bomb for the NAACP, and a hit on Salman Rushdie. The Berlin Wall comes down, and the U.S. claps down on illegal aliens. Ban the freedom of choice for those wanting abortion and enforce capital punishment. 24-hour radio ban for full guarantee, determined by the FUCC. Why are we so anesthetized to these lies? Because we do it in our own lives. We believe all the things that we want to hear. But then we also in Santa Cruz, activists organize local events, including a children's peace march and rally. We My name is Miranda Wienhausen. I'm from Alianza School and I'm five years old. All my family and friends have been wanting peace. Several nonviolent civil disobedience actions were also planned. At Fort Ord, 15 people were arrested during a protest of the Gulf War. I am Officer Brown of the Monterey County Sheriff's Department. I am declaring this an unlawful assembly and order you to leave this area immediately. If you do not leave, you will be arrested for failure to disperse. What ordinance are we breaking? Excuse me, I'd like to know what I'm being charged with. I'd, I'd like to know what I'm being charged with. I thought the First Amendment guaranteed me my right to speak out. I don't know what you're doing. I don't know why you're arresting me. Are you While the anti-war movement was growing in Santa Cruz and across the country, the war in the Persian Gulf was also gaining momentum. The United States dropped thousands of tons of bombs upon Iraq and Kuwait. Iraq targeted Israel with its Scud missiles, and the ground war 
as many had feared, did begin. As President Bush continued to assure us that a violent solution was the only possible resolution to the conflict, I wondered how this policy might be reflected here at home. Historically and prehistorically, there's always been a connection between the rise against uh, violence against women and, the, and prepare for preparation for war. Um, when a country is preparing for war, both preceding the war and during the war, there's a, a massive increase in violence against women. During wartime, of course, the lesson that's being taught is that homicide is a praiseworthy, necessary, regrettable, praiseworthy, but, it, but it, at base, an acceptable means of settling a conflict. If the government breaks laws, uh, it's contagious. And uh, I think in that sense, um, governments going to war and committing homicide reverses a lifetime of being told in society by parents, by school, by teachers, that you should solve your conflicts through discussion or negotiation, not through violence. If you do solve your conflicts through violence in kindergarten, you're put on a timeout. In uh, junior high, you're sent to the principal's office. In high school, you might end up in court or in juvenile hall. But suddenly, a war comes along, and the, the taboo on the use of violence is reversed. Uh, I happen to notice that during the Vietnam War, the homicide rate in the United States doubled. It was surprising that it did that, because it was already the highest homicide rate in the Western industrial democratic world. So when a nation goes to war, the country is making a statement about the appropriateness of taking human life. And it's saying that this conflict deserves to be solved through, through violence, and that uh, homicide, and after all, all wars involve acts of homicide, that homicide is an acceptable means of resolving conflicts. Rather ironically and tragically, only two days after the United States began its bombing, a Santa Cruz man was shot to death by police officers. The incident took place only 100 yards from where anti-war demonstrators were gathering. The proximity of this shooting to the protesters seems to have been coincidental. Yet, over time, I began to see that the killing of Carlos Machado in Santa Cruz and the killing of 100,000 Iraqis in the Gulf stemmed from the same horrifying method of conflict resolution, violence. In both cases, there were other options. added to the sense of disorientation and confusion that, I mean, just so, it's hard to take something like that kind of shooting and integrate it into our everyday lives. I mean, here, one, one day you're standing on the corner seeing some guy gunned down, and the next, what are you supposed to do that day? Go on with life as usual? And there's that same kind of feeling with the war. I think people feel a tremendous amount of guilt that we continue to lead our lives more or less as normal while this carnage is going on in the Middle East, and you, you can't, you feel like, you can't possibly do enough to stop it. What would it take to stop this war? People in Santa Cruz had responded with marches, rallies, seminars, direct actions, a war memorial, educational resources, and public forums with elected representatives. A week before he went into Kuwait, he was told by our State Department we don't have any treaties with Kuwait. Just don't take all of Kuwait. This is on the record. April Glassby speaking to Saddam Singh, who gave him the weapons, who built him up, who gave him the chemical capability, the nuclear capability, crude as it is. Germany, France, the Soviet Union, China, America, 
And now we send our young people to slay a tyrant we created and built? Congressman Panetta for him was a good example of uh, local politics, the fact that he's willing to come, the fact that he felt he had to come. I'm here tonight to make a specific request of you, Mr. Congressman, that you do everything you can to ensure that our nation will never and will not use nuclear weapons as a way to end this war. Then, after 44 days, the war was over. It's a proud day for America, and by God, we've kicked Vietnam Syndrome once and for all. And the flags continue to wave, and videotapes are made. But for whom is this war over? Not for the families of U.S. soldiers killed in combat, not for the people of Iraq who must bury their dead and rebuild their cities, or for the people of Kuwait where martial law has been instated by the United States government. Is this an indication of things to come in the new world order? The cost of the war to U.S. taxpayers will be billions of dollars. The cost to Iraqi families has been at least 100,000 lives. The cost to the environment is enormous. And children all over the world, from Baghdad to Santa Cruz, have been given a graphic example of massive destruction as a means of conflict resolution. For some, it is true. This war is over.